Okay, hello everybody. Hi friends. We're just going to give it a few minutes here um, for everybody to start filing in. Uh, we did have quite a few signups tonight, so I know it takes a few minutes for everybody to get on and get situated. I'm Kate. I work for the Algonquin Area Public Library District. A lot of you probably know me already, and if you don't, you'll be seeing a lot of me in the future. Um, I'm here tonight with Phil Alio. He is a local historian and author. And we're just gonna give this a few more minutes. I am recording this session tonight, just so you guys know, it's gonna be available on the AAPLD YouTube channel. So you can view it again after tonight. If you guys have any tech questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will address them as needed. You will not have access to your microphone or your camera as a guest tonight. We are gonna do this as a webinar and not a meeting but you shouldn't need it. If you have questions for Phil about his presentation or about his books, feel free to also put those in the chat and I will send them on to Phil to answer after the presentation ends. While we're getting situated, I'm gonna share a couple links with you guys, just like we always do. Um, let's see, what do we have coming up that you guys might like? Lots of fun stuff. I have a couple programs next week, and then I also have some history related stuff coming up in March. On March 2nd, which is a Tuesday, Martina Matheson is going to be portraying different women in history for us here on Zoom. You can sign up on our website and I'll post a link to the calendar in just a moment. On Wednesday, May 10th, we're going to have Clarence Goodman presenting on Chicago and kind of the Capone era. It's going to be called Murder, Mayhem, and the Mob. That's part of our 100th um, anniversary celebration here at the library. Then we also are going to welcome Jim Gibbons for a presentation on Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her life in the middle of March. And at the end of March, to wrap up Women's History Month, Leslie Goddard is going to do her new portrayal of us of a um, Queen Elizabeth II. She has not done this here for us before, so that'll be really fun. Um, make sure you guys sign up for all of those. Again, I will post a link for you in just a minute. Okay, Mary's already using her chat feature. That's awesome. I can always count on Mary to do that. She's very interactive. All right, guys. Just another minute and then I'm gonna turn things over to Phil. Um, I will not be on camera, but I will be here. If you guys need something and you have a tech question, just type it in the chat and I will get to it, okay guys? Let's see if we got any stragglers. Can you tell how many are on now? Yes, I can. We are up to 68. So okay. give it a few more minutes because we had quite a few more people sign up than that, but sometimes people just run a little late. Yeah. No big deal. I hope you guys are all having a, a good week staying warm. It's not been super nice outside for the past week or so. But hopefully things will get better soon. Okay. In the meantime, I'll post a link to our online calendar in the chat there. If you guys see any programs that you want to sign up for, feel free. If you have questions, you can always give me a call or send me an email. All right, Phil, I think whenever you're ready, we're going to let you take it away. And again, this is being recorded, guys. So if you miss anything or have to leave, I'll send it out to you in a couple days. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kate. Well, welcome everyone tonight to this presentation on Chicago, the first 100 years from 1833 to 1933. This information that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is based upon a new book that I just produced as of last year with the same exact title, which is see on your screen, Chicago, the first hundred years. So sit back and I hope you'll enjoy this. Well, to begin with, of course, this is Chicago today. It's a beautiful photograph, isn't it? A view of how Chicago looks. But it's interesting that 
In Chicago, the current population of this city is 2.75 million people in the city of Chicago proper itself. However, when you add in all the suburbs, the metro Chicago land area, you're talking 9.9 .9 million people living right in this area here in Northern Illinois. We have more people living within the Chicago metro area than do 40 states of the union. Imagine that. And this is how it works out. Here's the 40 states that have less population than we have right here in Chicago. The largest is New Jersey with a little bit over 9 million, the smallest being Wyoming, 579,000. So these are the 40 states that have less population than we do right here in Metro Chicago. Let's take it one step further. Doing the math, we have more people living in the Chicago Metro area today than the total population of the 10 following states combined. And here you see that list, one through 10. That's how populated this area is versus other parts of the country. It's amazing. So anyway, this is Chicago today. And this is Chicago in 1800. There was one residence and that was it. And here it is, Jean Baptiste Point de Saville, who was born in Haiti in 1750. He was of African and French descent and he's the one that's credited with being the founder of Chicago. He arrived in 1779 with his wife, Catherine, a son and a daughter, and started the city's first commercial enterprise, a river trading post on the North Bank, east of the Fork of the Chicago River. He also cleared a white oak forest for a cornfield, and he worked a farm in addition to his trade in furs. This is an illustration of his house. And this is probably pretty accurate as to how it looked, because this was done a long time ago. This is the location of where his cabin was located at in Chicago in 1779 and his trading post. Now, Jean Baptiste Pointe de Sable remained the only European living here along Lake Michigan for 21 years from 1779 to 1800. In 1800, he sold his property to a trader from Quebec, Canada, named Jean Baptiste Lalime. Now his bill of sale, I'm gonna go into, is interesting. It was also found in Detroit, Michigan in 1913, the bill of sale he used to sell this property. And his bill of sale included mirrors, a French walnut cabinets, and other furnishings that were really unusually fine for life on the frontier. His complex of buildings, domestic and commercial, and totaled 4,000 square feet back then. So he was undoubtedly running a major trading post back at that time. This included a main house with a ground floor space of 22 by 40 feet, two barns, a mill that ran by mule power, a bakehouse, a workshop, a dairy and a smokehouse. In addition, there were two calves, two mules, 28 hogs, 30 head of cattle and 44 hens. These are all the items that were found on the bill of sale that he sold when he sold the property to the line. Nothing changed along the shores of Lake Michigan until 1803. In the spring of 1803, the first men wearing the uniform of the US Army arrived in Chicago aboard the schooner Tracy. They were sent here by the Secretary of War, General Henry Dearborn, whose name was to be given to the fort that they were sent here to build. It was built at the south bank of the river where Michigan Avenue joins Wacker Drive today. And this is an illustration, a detailed illustration of what that original fort looked like. 
All went well for a number of years in this fort. The soldiers worked the gardens outside the fort. They swam in the water. They drilled regularly. Indian chiefs would come by at times. They also had fiestas, dances, games, wrestling matches, and races were some of the activities that were being enjoyed here at this fort back at that time period. A visitor named William Johnson is on record as saying, and I quote, Fort Dearborn is the neatest and best garrison in the country, unquote. Captain Whistler built the fort from his own plans. It had a 12 foot stockade along with iron crow's feet mounted on top. There were two block houses, as you can see in the um, illustration. One contained two cannons and the other contained one cannon as well as a large stand of small arms. As a person would enter the main gate facing south, he would immediately come upon the soldiers' barracks and also the hospital. 1812. The ushering in of 1812 experienced a period of civil unrest with the Indians, not just here in Chicago, but throughout the country. For the Native American Indians, the War of 1812 was a desperate struggle for their own freedom and independence. The Native American Indians became involved in the conflict to secure British support for their own war against the United States. There were reports of scalpings, for example, taking place by Indians in Wisconsin. So within a short time, more and more tribes were going on the war path. So on August 15th, 1812, at 9 a.m., an evacuation took place here at Fort Dearborn in Chicago. The soldiers rode out in formation, following, followed by the wagons containing the supplies, as well as many women and children on foot. Some were riding in the two wagons containing baggage, and at the rear were the men making up part of the militia. More than 50 U.S. soldiers and 41 civilians, including six women and 18 children, marched south from Fort Dearborn along the shoreline of Lake Michigan. When they came to the location of what is now the corner of 16th Street and Prairie Avenue, they were attacked by about 500 Potawatomi Indians. Almost the entire number of Fort Dearborn's occupants, save a few, were killed. Was a terrible massacre. And then the following day, the fort itself was burned down by the Indians. Here's a map of Chicago in 1812. You can see there's nothing at all. Brings a little closer here. Note here the fort. Hopefully you can see my arrow here or my um, pointer. Here's where the fort was located at, but notice here the name Wilmette is here. That's an important name because two people stayed in Chicago after this destruction in 1812, and that was Anton Wilmette and his Indian wife. They were the only two people that were living here in Chicago for a couple of years from 1812 on. They stayed here until 1816. So for four years, they were alone here in Chicago. It was one family, the Wilmettes, Anton and his wife. And then in 1816, John Kinsey, you'll note the house right below the Wilmette house says Kinsey's here. They were here, of course, before the massacre. They had left and they survived the massacre. And then they came back in 1816. And this was where their cabin was located at. They came back in 1816. And then that's the same year that the next Fort Dearborn was built. This is a great picture or of the map, I should say, of um, Chicago. So it shows the town surrounding Fort Dearborn and it shows how it continued to grow in population. This map is from 1833. By that time, the population of, this, of Chicago had grown to 350 residents. And so Chicago was incorporated in, on August 5th, 1833. And here's a blow up a little closer of that, of that area that we're speaking about. These are the streets. The city's boundaries were State Street to the east, Madison Street to the south, the Chicago River to the north, 
in Well Street to the west. That was the entire town of Chicago in 1833. The population, 350 people. That's it. With the removal of the Indians from the region due to the 1833 um, Treaty of, of Chicago, this area opened up for expansion and it started to grow at an unbelievable rate. In 1833 alone, 150 new buildings went up in Chicago and over 20,000 visitors passed through the town. 200 wagons per week would pull in at the campgrounds between Halstead Street and the river. Just amazing. The memories of the Chicago children in that period included fascination of the wagon parks at night when the supper fires and lanterns dotted the darkness. By day, the travelers revealed themselves to be lanky and bearded men, their wives worn looking and drably dressed, the children peering from wagons, their dogs slinging beneath. So the town grew exponentially. So we see here that by 1837, it was 4,170 people. So that's an amazing growth within four years time. And the growth continued to accelerate with the completion of the Chicago and Galena Union Railroad, which you'll see here, this depot. By 1850, the population reached 30,000 people. And by 1860, that number grew to 112,000. So look at that growth within a 10 year period from 30,000 to 112,000, it's amazing. I bring out this book, because this is a book that I have, which is so important. This book written by Edwin Oscar Gale is a history of Chicago. And he is a man who moved here as a small boy to Chicago in 1835. So he was here at the very beginning. He wrote this book in 1902. That's when it was copyrighted, as you can see in the top here. And then his preface, this is what he stated. It was at an early age that I began to make mental records of events connected with our growth. And but a few years later, when I commenced to jot down at my father's dictation or in reply to the questions I asked him, many of the facts which I shall now attempt to combine into a plain though truthful narrative of the early days of our city and vicinity. This book is amazing, the detail that he goes into, he must have had a photographic memory. And not only that, he must have been writing down details from a very early age. For example, well, before I go into that, I'm jumping the gun here. Let me come back for a second. I wanna mention here, first of all, about the travel where he came from. So this is a map and this map shows where his family came from when they arrived in 1835. Look at the bottom left here. It mentions Buffalo, New York. This is where the family left on a schooner to take a 900 mile journey that would take them through the Great Lakes to Chicago. They were on a brig that was named the Illinois. And so this, this is a 900 mile trek here. It took them 32 days to arrive from Buffalo, New York to Chicago. This is amazing. When they arrived, they stayed here that night at the Green Tree Hotel. This was their location, um, Lake Street and West Water Street. And you're gonna enjoy this. This is a tavern and the details he goes into about this are unbelievable. But this is how it looks today. What a change. He describes the room that they had in this hotel. He says, our room was about 12 by 12 with two windows, six by eight, two doors, two beds, two red pictures, two chairs, a carpet worn in two and was altogether too dirty for the comfort of persons unaccustomed to such surroundings. So this just goes on to show an example of the detail he went into in this book, which goes into so much about Chicago's growth over the next century. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Here's Chicago in 1853. If you note, pretty much the city is um, within the boundary of the Chicago River at this time. Here's Fort Dearborn in 1857. So by this time, the fort was already pretty drabby, down, you know, worn down, not being used perhaps for almost anything at this point in time any longer. The city is built around it, as you can see, with the um, buildings in the background. By the 1860s, Chicago had grown into one of the greatest metropolises of the country. Here's some examples. You know, for some reason, I'm sorry, but I'm my part of my top screen is cut off. Kate, is there a way I can get rid of this bar? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Let's see, what do the, you have up there? The bar is showing the mute, stop video, all this on top and I, it's cutting off my screen. I can't read what's going on above that. Oh, okay, let's see. Um, so towards the top, you should see an option for um, view, view options, I should say. If you scroll up to the top of your screen, it should kind of appear. Oh, hold on. Let me see here. Mm, I'm sorry, people, guys. Just get to the top so I can see what's going on here. <laughs> um, pause recording. I, I don't see that anywhere for okay. some reason here. Let's see. Try doing towards the right of your screen. There should, um, top right corner, there should be a little button that's going to say view and it has like panels on it. Pause, I see it. So it says more. See remote control, pause, share. Then I see more here. Options for video clip, leave, no. You can pause sharing for a moment. We can go back to it if you'd like. Okay, hold on a second, my friends. Okay. Okay. I don't see it here anywhere. Okay. You know what? I'll be I'll be okay. I just have Are to get a sure? book around it. I'm gonna have to. I don't see how to do it any otherwise. Pause recording, meeting information, hide video, hide video panel. Is Let's that try it? That. Let's try that. No, that's not. That's just hiding us. Yeah, I thought it might expand your screen a little bit. Oh, hide floating meeting controls. Try that. That's it. I got it. Okay. Yay. But now I but now I can't put everybody back on. I gotta go put everybody back on. Okay. Everybody. Okay, I can do it. I, I know how to do it. Your screen share. I can um, new share. Hit, hit resume share. Resume yeah. share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, my friends. I'm figuring this out. Hold on one second here. He's getting good, guys. Thank you guys for your okay. patience. Okay. There we are. Okay, we're back. Okay, sorry about that, my friends, but the top of the screen was cut off and I was running blind there and it was getting, I was getting confused. So now I'm clear. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna show here, just to go back for a second here, we're talking about how in the 1860s, Chicago had grown into one of the great metropolises of the country. So I wanna show some examples of the buildings that were here in Chicago in the 1860s. These are amazing. For example, here's the Shepherd Block built in 1869 at the, eight, the Southeast corner of Dearborn and Monroe Streets. Here's a view from the, the Rush Street Bridge in 1869. Look at the busyness of this canal, this waterfront. It's like an ocean front, but it's here in Lake Michigan. The amount of, of ships and the boats and the activity taking place, it's amazing. Here's the Tribune building, the first one that was built in 1869 that was located on the Southeast corner of Madison and Dearborn streets. These are beautiful structures built in the middle of the 1800s. Here's another photograph of Dearborn Street. This is looking from Madison Street around 1868. Lake Street, again, the same time period. This is interesting. This is the Michigan Southern Railroad Passenger Depot. 
And what an unbelievable structure this was. Construction on this building commenced on the 16th of April in 1866. It's of a Franco-Italian style. And the building measures, note, note this, 542 feet in depth by 160 feet wide. Imagine that, almost two football fields in length. This is a huge building. An 1867 description, when nearly finished, stated, in point of size and accommodations, it's one of the finest depots in the country. And when completed, it will present quite an imposing appearance. It contains five car tracks, three on the west side for the outgoing trains and two on the east side for incoming trains. The tracks are surrounded by platforms, 27 feet in width, <clears throat> excuse me, with a middle platform 16 feet wide. The interior sides of the walls will be frescoed and over each door and window will be painted an arch with the names of the various stations on the road. So it was an unbelievable structure. I'm gonna show you another illustration of how big this building is. Here you go. Look at the size of that structure built in the 1860s. This is the Briggs Hotel. It was called the Briggs House, a beautiful hotel. This hotel had 250 rooms and could hold up to 500 people. This was built in 1855 in the corner of Wells and Randolph Streets in Chicago. So, you know, these photos of these elaborate buildings of the 1860s, they're beautiful, but they hide the wearisome conditions that plagued the city up until the 1850s. And here's an example. This is talking about nuisances. This was in a paper published July 9th, 1836. It says, we've received several communications from citizens calling attention to nuisances in different parts of the town. The most prominent of which is a pond of water on Lake Street, corner of LaSalle, in the very heart of the town and inhabited by frogs. It smells strong now, and in a few days more will send forth a most horrible stench, sickening all who reside in the neighborhood. Cannot the hole be filled up, or is the health of our citizens to be sacrificed for a few dollars? And P.S. If any of the trustees are fond of frog music, they can enjoy a most delicious treat by taking a seat on the doorsteps of this office at the hour of sunset. So it's talking here about the conditions of the roads. The roads were so bad, for example, here, that there was a pond in the middle of the town with frogs in it, and it was smelling terrible, unbelievable. And why is this? The reason is, is because Chicago was built on the shores of Lake Michigan, and you have to remember that this was originally a swamp, a total swampland. So when it rained or when the snows melted, the roads in town became mires of mud to the point where many times they were unpassable by wagons or horse or even on foot. It was almost impossible to get around. And then add to this condition in summertime, um, with the, uh, just imagine the unimaginable amounts of horse droppings in the streets with the flies and the mosquitoes, no effective system of sanitation. What a mess it must have been living at that time. It's a fact too that the waste of all types was being dumped into the Chicago River at that time. And this even included de dead animal carcasses. So the stench and the filth of the city at this time period was a major issue. Something had to be done. They had to figure out a way of addressing the sanitation conditions of Chicago. So yep, the city was only four feet above Lake Michigan. So the pools of water, it was really a mess causing this issue. And in 1854, the cholera outbreak in Chicago killed one in 20 persons, again, because of these factors that we're talking about right now. Again, major health issues in Chicago. So 
The marsh on which the city was built was trying to claim back its territory. That's the bottom line. So what are they gonna do? A resolution was agreed upon. They're gonna raise the city. This is what they did. They decided to raise the entire city at that time up above the level it was at. And look at this ad from the 1857 newspaper in Chicago. It was entitled Raising Business Blocks. The subscriber would announce that he is ready to make contracts for raising business blocks to grade and all other operations pertaining to the removal or raising of buildings of wood, brick, or stone of any size to any desired height or to any distance. So they were looking to raise the entire city. And this, my friends, is what they did. Here is the Briggs House we spoke of earlier. Here they are raising the Briggs House in 1866. Look at all the men around the entire building hundreds and hundreds of individuals were involved here. They didn't just raise the Briggs house, they raised the entire city. We're talking anywhere from four feet to 14 feet in height. We're talking buildings, sidewalks and all straight up. They did this by the use of hydraulic jacks and mainly of jack screws. So this was a titanic, titanic feat of engineering imagination and really sheer moxie for them to do this. What an unbelievable activity. It got to the point where eventually they've even figured out how to raise an entire block at one time. They placed here in this picture here, this is an illustration where they had put 6,000 jack screws under the one acre block between Lake Street, Clark Street and LaSalle Streets. It weighed an estimated 35,000 tons in weight. And they raised the whole block up in four days, the buildings, the sidewalks and all. And they did this so smoothly that the businesses along this entire block never shut down. They were open for business every day as they continued to raise this entire block up into the air. Getting back to a couple other views of, of Chicago. This is the State Street Bridge. This was built in 1864, and this bridge was 184 feet in length. It was cost $32,000 to build it. It was just made of wooden braces, pretty much, and cords, that was it, solid wood, 184 feet. Now, where's this at today? Here's how it looked back then. Here's how it looks today. What a change, huh? Some other buildings that took place. This is the original Drake and Farewell House. This was destroyed by fire in 1870. Here's looking on west on Washington Street from Dearborn around 1867. By 1870, Chicago's population reached 300,000 people. 95% of the wage earners were foreign born individuals that were living here. And the average annual pay for the industrial employee, now this is working 60 hours a week, it came to $405 per year. That's 13 cents per hour. That's what they were making pretty much at that time. What a change from today, huh? We're talking now about 1871. This was a very, very dry year. From early July through the month of August and September, only one inch of rain had fallen on the city of Chicago for that whole time period. Chicago drummers were traveling in their buggies along the country roads. They seen grass fires all over the place, rushing across the prairies. When I say Chicago drummers, that's a term that was used for salesmen. So salesmen were called drummers. In the Michigan and Wisconsin lumber country, millions of blackened stumps on thousands of ruined acres showed where forest fires had burned out the entire area. It was really a bad year. 
So here in Chicago, there was a great amount of dry wood. It was masked behind stone and cast iron along the business streets. It was openly used from floor to roof on, on most of the houses in the residential districts. Joseph Meadow warned in the Tribune newspaper that the city had reached a dangerously combustible state with its everlasting pine shingles, shams, veneers, stucco, and putty. In addition to the danger of pine shingles catching fire, the tarred roofs invited disaster. At noon, the pitch would bubble in the sun, seemingly just a degree or two under the level of explosion. So this was a very perilous time period we're talking about. Sometime in the evening of this date, October 8th, 1871, it's memorialized that at number 137 DeCoven Street, the O'Leary cow knocked over the lantern in the barn. O'Leary blamed it on children playing in the barn. So whatever it had set it off, something did. And the fire spread north from DeCoven Street within minutes. When the fire was finally out on October 10th, there were four square miles that had been turned into charred rubble. 100,000 people were homeless. 100,000 people. Commercial structures, including all the hotels, the theaters, the commercial structures of the business district, totaling 18,000 buildings were destroyed in this fire. 250 bodies were found in the ruins. About the same number died without a trace, vaporized at the inner parts of the fire. The Board of Trade estimated the property loss to be at around $200 million. That's back in 1871 dollars. Today, that translates to $4.2 billion. So in, that, in those days, even today, it's an inconceivable amount of money we're talking about here. Here's a map that shows the devastation from this fire. The upper left corner, you'll see the red arrow. This is the origin of where the O'Leary house was at and how the fire spread north. Look at the hundreds upon hundreds of blocks that were wiped out. Unbelievable. So the O'Leary home after the fire is looked at here in this photograph here. And I love this picture. It shows them the people standing. They're standing where the barn was located at prior to the fire. Of course, it's gone at this time. So this is where it started in Chicago in 1871. The address was 137 DeCoven Street, but it changed in 1909 to 558 West DeCoven Street. I'll show you another picture of the um, area from a different angle. Here's the house from the street, the O'Leary house where the fire began that caused the Chicago fire. These are some photographs that will just blow you away with regard to the devastation. Here we are looking north from Fifth Avenue and Madison Street. This is in October, 1871. Here's a clearer shot. Everything just totally vaporized, gone, blocks upon blocks. This is the corner of State and Madison Street after the fire. Here's the courthouse that was built in 1848. You'll see it on the left. This is how beautiful the structure looked. But then going to the right, you'll see the devastation of that building. Now, this is interesting. This is again showing devastation, but look at the, in the center of the photograph, you'll see the Chicago River. They were hoping the Chicago River would stop the fire, but it didn't, it jumped right over the over the Chicago fire, or over the um, Chicago River. In fact, because of the fact that the Chicago River was so polluted, as I was talking about earlier, part of the Chicago fire, or Chicago River, I'm sorry, started on fire itself. So the water itself actually ignited, it was so um, filthy and, and polluted at that time. 
Here's the Tribune building we showed earlier to the left, and now look at it to the right. This is the Trinity Church on Madison Street. This is an illustration of how it looked prior to the fire. And this is afterwards. The next day after the fire was over, the fire ended on October 10th. So on October 11th, the Chicago Tribune printed a newspaper one day later. And on the very top, it states the Chicago Tribune has opened its office at, well, it's hard to read the address there, but at um, 10 South Canal Street, West Division. And the paper will hereafter be regularly issued from that place till further notice. But what's important is what it says afterwards, because it shows the, the attitude of people in Chicago at that time. It says, cheer up. In the midst of a calamity without parallel in the world's history, looking upon the ashes of 30 years accumulations, the people of this once beautiful city have resolved that Chicago shall rise again. With woe on every hand, with death in many strange places, with two or three hundred millions of our hard earned property swept away in a few hours, the hearts of our men and women are still brave and they look into the future with undaunted hearts. As there has never been such a calamity, so has there never been such a cheerful fortitude in the face of desolation and ruin. So they were looking to rebuild the city of Chicago and believe me, they did and they did so rapidly. Within a couple of years time, there was almost no signs of the fire at all. The city was totally rebuilt in a very short period. Here's the first building that was built. Within days of the Chicago fire of 1871, this man, William D. Kerfoot, erected the first building in the Fern District of 89 Washington Street. An enterprising real estate agent, Kerfoot posted a sign proclaiming, all gone but wife, children, and energy. Here to show some examples of, of the reconstruction of the city of Chicago. Here's the corner of Lake and LaSalle, 1873. Here's the southeast corner of North LaSalle and West Washington in 1872. And you'll note there on the, on the top of the roof there, you'll see the men working, though they are finishing the roof of the Chamber of Commerce building. Here's the, the third Sherman house that was built on the, at the corner of North Clark and Randolph Streets. Again, a beautiful structure. This is the Chicago and Northwestern Well Street train terminal built around 1900, a beautiful building. This is on the corner of Wells and Kinsey Street or Kinsey Avenue. And this was the original location of that train depot I shared with you earlier of the Chicago and Galena Railroad or um, depot. So that small one was replaced by this one. Here's the Dearborn train station. This picture was taken around 1910. And it's interesting that this building still exists. Here's how it looks today. So you'll see the roof line has changed. The peak roof to the, um, the original picture, that's all been removed. And look at the top of the tower as well, how they've removed again that whole section. I personally prefer the way it used to look. I think that's beautiful, but still, still to this day, it's a very sharp building. This building is interesting. This is a huge structure. This was the post office and the government building that was built in 1889. And I'm gonna talk about this building a little bit just to get an idea of the size and the activities that were going on in this structure. On the three upper floors, there were 65 rooms occupying by eight divisions within with 20 different departments of the government were involved here. 
on the main floor, it was surrounded by a great lobby, and this was the post office. There were 3,500 people working in this building, 3,500 people. They had one freight elevator, 10 mail elevators, and four passenger elevators in this building. And it was stated that this building never closed. It was open continuously, day and night. And an estimated 50,000 persons walked through the doors of this building every day, 50,000 people. So quite the structure, quite the building. So whatever happened to the O'Leary House on DeCoven Street, you might ask. Well, today it's the location of the Chicago Fire Academy. How ironic is that? That's what's there today. They do have a plaque on the wall talking about Miss O'Leary's home, but that's what's there at this that address today. Here's a few other streets or shots of the streets, which I'll share with you. I think are very interesting and. Just amazing to show the size of these buildings that were built, but more, but to me too, look at the crowds. I mean, that is unbelievable, the amount of people um, that were in the city back at this early time period. This is 1903. Look at State Street in 1900. This photograph caught my eye. This is the corner of State and Madison. And for those of us that have been down in Chicago, something might look familiar to you here. Look at the building to the very right with all the beautiful ornamental ironwork there. That looked familiar to me. And you know why? Because it's still there today. Look at that for a moment and see how it changes. There it is today right now. So the, that building still exists as it did in 1907. Talk about busy. Holy smoke. We think we have traffic jams today. Look at this traffic jam. This is the corner of Randolph and Dearborn Street in 1909. So we can see that traffic jams are not a new thing in our generation, that's for sure. Back then, they had no traffic lights as yet. In fact, at this time, they weren't even invented yet. The world's first electric traffic light didn't come into place until 1914. And that wasn't in Chicago. That was in Cleveland, Ohio. Chicago didn't get its first traffic light until 1923. So up until that date, this is the nightmare we had to deal with when it comes to traffic. Again, look at this photograph showing the activity on Water Street. But this activity here is a little different than what we just saw previously because Water Street um, was just one street south of the Chicago River. So the Chicago River is only a block away. So what would happen is that the goods would be unloaded from the ships and the barges and they'd be brought over to the street, to Water Street, to the market stalls to be sold. So this was a marketplace at that time period. That's what you're seeing here with all the various peoples selling their goods, their vegetables, their fruits and whatever. A man named Edwin Griswold Norris wrote a book called The Chicago Produce Market. And he stated in that book that South Water Street is sometimes referred to as the busiest street in the world. Maybe he's right. It's an amazing picture. But one thing too that I noticed in this picture that caught my eye, look at the upper left there, the name Eastland. I'll blow that up a little bit here. The Eastland um, for South Haven, this was a shipping company that had ships and the Eastland name, perhaps many of you know where I'm going to with this, is a very, very important name in history. This ship was one of their ships. It was called the Eastland. On October 24th, 1915, thousands gathered along the Chicago River for Western Electric's fifth annual employee picnic. 
and more than 7,000 tickets had been purchased for the day-long festivities. And many of them were gonna go on various tours on this ship, the Eastland that was docked at the Clark Street Bridge um, on the Chicago River. But what happened is that when the first group of the Western Electric uh, members of the employees came on board, hundreds of them at a time, they went to the edge of the ship and the ship flipped over, causing a terrible, terrible um, death to these individuals, tragedy. The tragedy struck as the ship rolled over into the river at the wharf's edge. There were 2,500 passengers on this ship when this happened. 844 people lost their lives this day on the Eastland, right here in the Chicago River. And to, the, you know, to this day, that's the greatest shipwreck and loss of life in the Great Lakes history. It happened right here in Chicago on this date. Other photographs that just talk about Chicago. Look at this picture here. Oh, what happened just now? There we go. Okay. I like this picture here. It shows a um, police wagon of the Chicago Police Force in the 1890s. How about this? Here are two of Chicago's police cars in 1910. So they had three police cars total in 1910. These are two of them. They were first motorized as of 1907. So these are some of the first squads, you might say, of the police, Chicago Police Force that ever existed. World's Columbian Exposition, 1893. This will touch on as well for a few minutes because this was an unbelievable World's Fair, the World's Columbian Exposition. More than, it covered more than 600 acres in Chicago. 46 nations were represented in, in this um, World's Fair. And it was attended to by 27 million people came to this fair as in over a six month period of time. So a remarkable World's Fair was taking place here in Chicago. And there were actually a number of companies right from my area here in Dundee and Algonquin that had uh, various exhibits at this World's Fair. Dundee's D Hill Nursery, for example, had a huge exhibit, as did Carpentersville's Illinois Iron and Bolt Company, among others. Here's some photographs of the exposition. It was called the White City, and you can see why. It was all done in white stucco. It was beautiful. Again, a very well-known shot, but a beautiful photograph. Just imagine this city at nighttime, all white, but realizing too that this was the first city in the world that was electrified with electric light. Westinghouse and Tesla electrified this entire World's Fair. It was the first time anywhere that people would see electric light being used to this degree. So what is that? a magnificent, view to see for the world at that time in 1893. And you can tell that these buildings were huge as well. Here's the Machinery Hall. This building alone was 850 feet by 500 feet in size, just one building. Here's another view. It's just amazing. But now this is the Ferris wheel. And this is the original Ferris wheel, designed and constructed by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. So this is the first Ferris wheel that ever existed. This thing was huge. It had a height of 264 feet. So it was the largest attraction at the fair in Chicago. And this opened up for people to come to and ride on June 21st, 1893. Just imagine this here. Imagine being alive in 1893. Where could you get up into the sky 260 feet? There were very few, there were probably no buildings at that height yet at that time, no, no um, 
skyscrapers were built to that height of 26 floors that I know of. So to be able to go up into a, a Ferris wheel and be viewing the city from 26 stories up, what an amazing um, thrill that would be for people. Now note too, these cars, they're not the typical Ferris wheel cars that we have today. These cars were huge. There were 36 of them on this Ferris wheel. 36 cars, each car had 40 revolving chairs within it. And they were each capable of accommodating 60 people. So 60 persons could be in each of these cars at any one time, given a total capacity for this Ferris wheel at 2,160 people at any one time. So this wheel carried some 38,000 passengers daily. It took 20 minutes to complete a two revolution ride. The first revolution included six stops to allow passengers to exit and enter. So they did, they emptied out and filled um, six cars at a time. If you look at the lower part of that photograph, you'll see different levels. So there was, on the, there was three levels for people to exit and enter into the cars. So they would go out one door and they would come in the other on the other side of the of the um, cart itself. So six at a time would be filled and emptied, and then they'd do another rotation, and that was the nonstop rotation. It would take nine minutes to go around one revolution. So for nine minutes they'd be going around um, the um, Ferris wheel here for a total of twenty minutes. So what a ride that must have been. It was the leading, or one of the leading um, activities or uh, you know, things here at the fair to see at that time. And you know, you know what it cost to do this? 50 cents. That was, that was the cost to ride the Ferris wheel. So you may think for 50 cents, that's not too much money. It was a lot of money back then. The average worker at that time made 14 cents an hour. So when I'm saying 50 cents, he had to work three and a half hours, the average worker, to get a ride on the Ferris wheel. So let's take let's think about that today. If you're making what minimum well, ten dollars an hour, let's say, just even ten dollars an hour, you're talking thirty-five dollars at ten dollars an hour today to ride this Ferris wheel. And I think that people on average are making more than ten dollars an hour. So this shows you the expense. Of what it cost back then. This was really a treat, but people loved it. It was a huge attraction. In 1933, 40 years later, there was another World's Fair here in Chicago. This was the Century of Progress. And this was, again, another huge World's Fair, very, very well received. And I'll just show you a few photographs of this. This is an aerial view of the Century of Progress World's Fair. And it had so many features that are unique. For example, here, General Motors actually developed an actual assembly plant here at the World's Fair in Chicago. So you can look in the, in the background, there are the hundreds of people that are viewing this taking place. This is a huge attraction, watching how cars were being built in 1933. They had a train exhibit. It was remarkable. Even a Mayan temple was brought in or developed and built here for the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933. This here amazed me. This is a very cool photograph. First of all, you'll see the Goodyear blimp in the background, but look at the structure. This is Nash, a car that used to be around at that time. It hasn't been around now for decades, but think about this. Here, this is 90 years ago, eight level um, of, of car, you know, eight levels, you know, stories high, and these cars were on like turntables. They would rotate and turn. There were 16 cars in here that would rotate in glass plate windows. This is 90 years ago. So what a modern, the way it just, it's so, so modern for that time period. It's just really amazing. 
Here's the, the showroom for Cadillac, 1933. Love to have one of these cars today, wouldn't you? Just beautiful. So there were many big things here at the fair, but there were small things too. Look at this. This is the world's smallest Bible. This was in the Hall of Religion. So that's a teaspoon that, that person is holding. That Bible is fitting into the, the bowl of a teaspoon. It was made in, or printed in 1895 in Scotland. It included 520 pages sewed together with silk thread. And there were a total of 181,253 words printed on this little tiny Bible. It took four years to make this. Is that amazing? So there were many things to see here at this fair. By 1933, Chicago had grown from a cluster of a dozen log huts at the site where the Chicago River meets Lake Michigan to a booming city of 211 square miles and a population of almost 3.5 million people. Over those hundred years, ground value grew from a few thousand dollars to more than five billion dollars. So how much did things cost then in 1933? The average cost of a house, $5,750. You would actually make on the average about $1,550 a year in wages. You could buy a gallon of gas for 10 cents. You could rent a house for $18 a month. And if you wanted to have a vacuum cleaner, that was $17.75 a month. So think about that. A full month's rent is what it would cost to buy a typical vacuum cleaner back then. Very expensive object at that time period. Whereas a loaf of bread cost just seven cents or a pound of hamburger meat, 11 cents. Plymouth car, Plymouth 6, $445. That's a total price for a brand new Plymouth in 1933. Can of vegetable soup from Campbell's, 10 cents. And how about this? A 1933 vintage radio, $52. That is a lot of money at that time period. An average laborer's wage was $20 per week. So you'd have to work two and a half weeks to be able to afford to buy a vintage radio in 1933. At that time, that was modern technology. It was very expensive. Isn't that amazing? How about life in 1933? What was it like to be alive back then? What were the activities or at the Activities and things happening around the world at that time. Here's some examples. First of all, 1933 was the worst year of the depression. The depression started in 1929, but it peaked in 1933 with unemployment reaching 25.2% of the population. So one in four persons were not, was not working in 1933. That was devastating. Adolf Hitler became the chancellor of Germany and opened the first concentration camp in Dachau. Tens of thousands traveled the road and rail in, in America looking for work. The continuing drought in the Midwest made even more of the land into a dust bowl. On the other side, some good things that were happening. Shirley Temple signed her first contract with Fox when she was just five years old. The original King Kong movie was shown in 1933. The first ever drive-in theater was established in New Jersey. The chocolate chip cookie was invented. Isn't that something? You think those were been around forever. They didn't exist till 1933. The board game Monopoly was invented in 1933. And the 18th Amendment to the Constitution is repealed, ending prohibition in the US in 1933. On January 5th, the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge began in San Francisco. 
Mount Rushmore was dedicated. On October 17th, Albert Einstein arrived in the US as a refugee from Nazi Germany. And then in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt stated the infamous quote, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Well, this concludes this evening's presentation on Chicago. I hope you've enjoyed it. We're going over a lot of different topics uh, with regard to this city from 1833 to 1933. If you'd like to obtain the book that has this information in it, I'm going to show you how to do that now, okay? This is the cover of the book. It's called Chicago, the First 100 Years. And if you were to go to my website, and I'm going to show you how to do that, just click on aliopublications.com. You should take it right over to there. There it is. It opens up to the home page of the website. The home page, first of all, welcomes you to the web page, and then it shows the newest titles that are available right now. So right now I have about four books that are fairly new that are out right now. And it discusses all these on the home page. But if you click on the our bookstore page, or tab, I should say, it brings you to the bookstore where all the books that I've written and others that I've published for other people are on. And I just want to show you how this works because it's pretty cool. So for real example, quick, we can't huh? see your um, screen. We can only see oh, the end of your PowerPoint. So I'll try to close oh, really? out of your PowerPoint and see what happens. Maybe we could see it oh. then. Okay. Let me minimize this. Okay, let's see here. Can you see it now? Still no? on your PowerPoint, that's strange. Okay, hold on a second here. Screen sharing is stopped, it's shared, okay. Yeah, so you might try going to your website and then clicking start screen share one more time. Yeah, okay. Share screen, okay. There we go. How's that? Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. you have now? Okay. Thanks for saying something. I didn't realize that. So I'm glad I know that. So you didn't you didn't see it then from the beginning where I went to the home page. This is how the website opens up at A Little Publications. It shows the newest books that are available, as I was saying. But there's a tab that says our bookstore. And if you click on there, it takes you to the various books available, as I was saying earlier. But I just wanted to show you how one how the books are designed so you know what you're getting here. On the Chicago book, that book will come up if we give a brief description, um, add to cart. But what's nice about this, all the books have this, where you can go through every book and see various pages of how the book is you know, designed, how it looks, information that's in here. And going through this here, you'll see that just about everything that we brought out tonight is in this book, plus a ton more. The book is 112 pages filled with um documentation and history written as well as photographs that'll um, really help to appreciate what uh, the city of Chicago is all about and what's happened over the last hundred years. So that's pretty much it. So I hope that was enjoyable. It was a little different doing a presentation on Zoom and, and not in front of an audience, that's for sure. <laughs> you so, definitely did a very good job. And I just want to note for you guys that Many of Phil's books, not just this one, but some others that he's written about the Fox River Valley, about our community, about the Dundee community, are also available um, through the library to check out. Um, and if you guys have a few more minutes, and if you do, Phil, we did get some questions from from um, attendees that are kind of interesting. Good. So I'll try and answer those if those. I can. Mm -hmm. I think you can do it. Okay, let's go back to the first one here. Okay, Karen wants to know, where did you get your pictures? They are so clear. You know, first of all, that book I mentioned earlier from 1902, there are some beautiful um, pictures in that book, first of all. And also I have other books too that um, have photographs in them. I have another book that's from the 1893 Columbian Exposition from 1893. I have the actual souvenir book, which has photographs in there. Um, and many of these photographs I've just collected over the last 15 years or so, I've had these for many years. 
And I decided, you know what? They're now all public domain, so I can use them the way I want to because they're all more than 90 years old. So nobody has copyright laws or you know restrictions on them any longer. So I decided to go ahead and publish them because of that reason. Does that make that sort of question? I think it does. If not, I'm sure she'll let us know. Um, Mark asked, okay. can you discuss the early businesses that were the foundation of the city? Um, the stockyards, the development of the railroads, and the impact on the founding of the catalog companies like Sears or Wards? Well, boy, if that's a that's a really a heavy question. There's a that lot is, so much it's, information. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah. There. I'll, I'll mention a couple a couple points I will mention, okay? For example, about the stockyards. Let's talk about those for a moment. You know, I mentioned earlier about the um, pollution and um, of the, of the um, Chicago River, for example. The stockyards were a huge factor with regard to that. In fact, to this till this day, right now, there's a portion of the Chicago River, and I don't recall exactly the area it's at. I think it's down a little further south. Um, but anyway, it's called um, Bubbly Creek, and the reason why it's called that because they used to dump all the carcasses in the the, the waste of the animals into the Chicago River. To this day, it's over a meter thick in depth, I should say, of these animal parts that are still in that river and they're bubbling up to this day, causing the pollution. So it's the most polluted part of the river because of the stockyards. Um, it's, it's really remarkable. So um, what else can I tell you about? When it comes to the railroads, the Galena um, Railroad in Chicago was the first railroad that existed because Galena was around before Chicago even got started. Um, in fact, Galena was actually larger than Chicago for up until the 1840s. Uh, it was a major um, industrial development because of the lead mining going on there. So that was the main railroad going from Chicago to um, Galena. And then really from there, I really, and that, prepared to answer any more detail about the um, railroads other than that, that I can tell you the second off the top of my head. And what was the other point he mentioned? You mentioned railroads, you mentioned, oh, businesses. The, uh, the effect business. that it had, or the um, the impact I should say it had on the founding of like the major catalog companies like Sears, Wards, Fields. Oh, wow. Well, Marshall Fields got a start here and so did Sears was very huge here. In fact, the Sears catalog store, in fact, um, Sears, well, I wish I had some time to show those pictures of that. One of the large, Sears, Sears these are all catalog stores, but they were involved with um, selling everything that a person could use. For example, Sears, you could even buy houses from Sears and their catalog that they had, Sears Homes was a big part of that. And those were all here from Chicago. They were shipping out homes all over. Um, the largest concentration to this day now of Sears homes is in Elgin, for example. Here in Dundee, there's, I know of 10 homes that are Sears homes. So it had a big impact. Um, hope I'm answering that question properly. So I'm trying to think of what else I can say about that. I think that answers it pretty well. And yes, there are a lot of Sears catalog homes in Elgin, a lot. Yes, over 200 of them are in Elgin. Mm -hmm. um, they all came from Sears. And, I actually have that documented in another book that I'm preparing right now. Um, the whole chapter on the Sears homes in this new book, which I might mention to you all. Is it okay if I do that, Kate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been working on a book for a couple of years and it's, it's the compilation of over 20 years of research. It's gonna be seven to 800 pages in size. It's gonna be a two volume set. It's called Dundee Township, It's Forgotten History. And I'm going into so many details of topics like the Sears Homes of Dundee. Another chapter is on the um, Underground Railroad, uh, you know, regarding the movement of the, of the slaves from the South to Canada before the Civil War. It all was, Dundee was all a part of that. Um, there's so many different topics. The Indians that were here, the Potawatomi, and actually I go back to the mound builders a thousand years ago, um, so many topics. I mean, it goes on and on, it's like 32 chapters very comprehensive. So that's gonna that's gonna go into a lot of details about the Sears homes, for example, in that book. So that's gonna be coming Great. out probably in June. 
Awesome. Sure. Um, another question we got was from Nancy. She said in 1899, there was a photo of the market she showed and it looks like there are L tracks raised up. Was the L in service then? Yes, it was. Yeah. The, a lot of the L tracks were built for the 1893 Columbian Exposition as when they were built for. So like on Lake Street and all that, that was all around 1890, that started that I know of in 1893. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, you said 95% of Chicago's wage earners were foreign born at one point. Where were they from and why did they make their way to Chicago? Chicago was the location, I mean, for people coming from, from Europe. I mean, oh, oh my goodness. Um, as far as, oh my goodness, po Polish, Italian, it goes, oh, there's so many from different, all over, the, all over Europe that were coming to Chicago because it was such a land of opportunity and because of the business opportunities here. Oh my, and boy, I think that in the early 1900s, I'm, I should have checked this out before I came on tonight, but at one time, Chicago was, I think the largest city in the country, even larger than New York. I'm, I wanna say, but possibly around the 1930s, that was the case. Because the population today is 2.7 million, I think, but back then it was 3.5 billion. So Chicago has actually lost population, not gained it. It's actually gone down in size. But uh, uh, the amount of, of work that was here, people were coming here for work, for jobs, make money. And that's why they came. Awesome. Okay, what happened to the Ferris wheel and the Mayan temple? All the buildings in, in the... Um, um, exposition. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about the wrong fair here. That was in the 33, uh, 1933 World's Fair. I don't know what happened to the Mayan Temple. I have no idea. So if it's the case like it happened in the other World's Fair from 1893, those buildings were all built temporarily. They weren't built as permanent structures. They were built to be torn down. And it's amazing they would build 500 and 600 foot buildings and then just wipe them, destroy them afterwards. But they did that from the 1893. They may have done that probably too for the 1933 World's Fair because um, after that fair was over, those buildings were all removed. And what was the other point she asked, asked about? The temple and the Ferris wheel. The Ferris the wheel. Mayan temple. The yeah. Ferris wheel, boy, I have that information. Hold on, where do I have that written at? Hold on one second, I can tell you, okay? Okay, great, thank you. Let's see if I can find that real fast. Well, fills away. I'm going to ask you guys, those of you that are still on, and there are quite a few of you, if you won't mind just hanging out after we close the webinar in a few minutes, there's going to be a short survey. We'd really appreciate it if you fill it out. It's great for feedback for me and for Phil. You guys have been a great audience. You have lots of questions. Okay, here in the book, I discuss what happened with the um, Ferris wheel. So this is what the answer is to that question here. Okay, the exposition ended in October, 1893. The wheel closed in April, 1894, was dismantled and stored until the following year. It was then rebuilt on Chicago's north side near Lincoln Park, next to an exclusive neighborhood. This prompted William D. Boyce, then a local resident, to file a circuit court action against the owners of the wheel to have it removed but without success. So it operated there by Lincoln Park until about 1903. And then it was again dismantled. And then it was transported by rail to St. Louis for the 1904 World's Fair. And finally, it was destroyed by controlled demolition using dynamite on October 11th, 1906. So there you go with the answer to that question. Wow. wow. wow crazy that they used dynamite to destroy it. Um, yes. I'll tell you something else like about the world, the, about the Ferris wheel that's amazing. It actually operated by two locomotive engines. Those are what ran the Ferris wheel. I mean, the weight of that Ferris wheel, the axle alone, the tons of weight that the axle itself weighed is unbelievable. It's all broken down in the book. I go into a lot more detail than I did on the slide presentation about that Ferris wheel. It's amazing. Cool. Um, Mary says, what was, what 
was the politics like in the early days? Did they have a board of trustees or a village president? They had a mayor and they probably had, it was a corporation, it was incorporated and politically it was just as crazy as today. And you know why? You know, we always heard, hear the term the Windy City. People think it's called the Windy City because of the wind. No, it's called the Windy City because of politics, because of the, because of the, the, the windy politicians the, talking out of the hot air, so to speak. So politically, it was divisive, um, as politics is today, back then even. So it's interesting. Things had not changed. I, I'll add one more point to that, if you don't mind, Kate. Um, as you know, I'm doing the um, Dundee Hawkeye newspaper from 1890 to 1917. And the amount of newspaper articles that are in there about politics in Chicago and in Dundee and throughout the country, I should say, really, throughout the country would surprise you how the divisiveness that we see today was just like it was back then. It's amazing. Diane wants to know, you mentioned the post office. Is this the one that's above the Eisenhower Expressway? I don't know for sure if it is or not. I didn't check into that. I don't know the answer to that, if it is or not. Okay. I don't I don't think it is, but you know what? Look at it again once, hold on a second. I don't know for sure. I'm just gonna find it real fast. Let's see here. And okay, real quick, like I want to do. I'm looking, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to find it real fast here so I can find it. Look at the picture again. No problem. I don't see it. I don't recall offhand. I can't answer that question. No problem. Right. Okay. It looks like we got one more. When was the river straightened out to form the harbor and the little tributaries filled in? Mm. You know what? I'm so bad. This is a hard time bringing up numbers like that in my head off, off the top of my head. I just am not able to do that at this moment to tell you when that was. Um, if she wants to, if she wants to know, you know, it's, um, my email is P. Alio at Alio Publications. Shoot me that question. I'll be happy to find her the answer for that and give it to her, okay? So it's P. Alio at AlioPublications.com. And I could look up that answer for her, but I just can't recall it to my head right now to tell you the answer to that. No problem. Okay. I did, I threw your email in the chat there. So if anybody else has questions, feel free to uh, reach out to Phil or you can reach out to me and I can get in touch with him. Um, we talk all the time, so that wouldn't be a big deal. That looks like it's everybody's questions. Uh, we got a lot of positive feedback, lots of people that enjoyed the presentation. So I'm thank just you. gonna wrap things up. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Phil, for joining us. You did a great job. Um, thank you. Seamless transition from library to, to virtual. So hopefully we'll <laughs> be able to have you back in the building uh, for real very soon. But in the meantime, this worked out very well. Thanks, Kate. Thank you very much. And again, guys, if you're still with us, um, just hang out for a moment. When we close the webinar, there's going to be a short survey. It's just eight question that questions that pop up. If you could please fill it out for me, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the feedback, and I'm sure Phil will too. Um, and I will see you guys all very soon, I'm sure. Everybody have a good night. Good night. Bye, now. Phil. Thank you.